Uh, okay, cool, cool, cool. Uh, let's just get started. So this is gentle introduction to building serverless apps um, with MongoDB Stitch. Uh, cool. So let's just get into this. Let's actually, I'm going to introduce myself first, kind of continue off that. So I'm Joe. Um, previously, I was technical lead for Best Buy uh, That was I did that for a couple of years. Got helped us get through a couple of Black Fridays, which is great. Um, and then I've been at MongoDB now for probably about two months. Um, I'm working as a software engineer and um, developer advocate. I'll be doing some work on the Node.js drivers as well. I haven't started working on that yet, as of yet, though. Um, that's my website, my Twitter. Um, I'd recommend, I'm going to be posting um, links and resources that we talked about in this deck today. Um, I'll be posting the slides. I'm also recording this right now, too, so we're posting YouTube videos of this if you want to share or like look at that later. Right, I'll be on my, my Twitter, so feel free to post it on it, too. Um, I also post a lot about um, ethics and tech, uh, Performance, uh, just programming in general, whatever. So anyway, great stuff. You that stuff that's interesting too. So, um, okay. So I do. Li I like to set ground rules for talks like this. Uh, every speaker is a little bit different, and I think it kind of helps kind of understand how like how we can like kind of work best together. So um, first thing is, I want you to know, it's feel free to like interrupt me today. Um, this is a really small intimate group, so like this use that, right? Like um, I see this more as like a classroom kind of setting as opposed to like me lecturing in front of everybody. So if you have a question, like go ahead and ask it. It doesn't like get my flow off or anything like that either. Plus, I like like answering the question while we're like in it, you know? Um, we will have questions at the end, so feel free to like jump in if you ever do that later. Or if you don't feel comfortable asking for a group, I'll be here afterward. You can just ask me one-on-one -on -one or on Twitter too. So just hit me up there. Um, cool. Let's see here. So the goal of this talk, it's a gentle introduction so, uh, to serverless. I'm going to be kind of introducing serverless platforms in general. We're going to be doing that via Stitch, which I'm guessing no one here has heard of, which is totally OK. Um, but I do want, I want to kind of get a quick little poll here of kind of experience levels. Um, who here has, is doing serverless work professionally right now? OK, cool, awesome. Um, who, has, uh, who wants to learn but hasn't done any yet? Has anyone done like a little bit? I'm just kind of tinkering on the side a little bit. Okay, cool. Um, and uh, the other question too, MongoDB is who has experience working with MongoDB before? Cool. Does anyone use it professionally? I'm sure a lot of people here have used it like on a side project at some point, whatever. Okay, cool. Awesome. Um, great. Um, so anyway, the goal today is just like to get a quick overview of it and then get to know MongoDB Stitch too. Um, there will be like a little bit, I'm not going to do live coding. I, in the introduction, we talked about a little bit about doing that. Um, for the sake of time, I'm just going to, I have, we're going to kind of go over some code we've kind of written. And I want you to leave this talk not having like to fully understand how to set up an app on your own, but to like know the basics and know what's available and to know if that's going to be a good or bad tool for you to use when you're building up your next application. Um, okay, cool. Other thing too, so this is, um, this is a new talk too, so I'm open to feedback too. If anyone has any like uh, uh, any thoughts, tips, whatever, or anything you think is wrong, I'd love to know. I don't get defense about it. Helps make everything better too. So, okay, cool. Um, yes, great. Any questions so far? No. All right, great. Uh, all right, so we're gonna be going. I'm just gonna do a quick overview of MongoDB. Um, another question about that. Who? When was? Who? Use MongoDB within the last week. Who's using last year? Last two years? Last five years? Cool. Yeah. Um, so I have a confession to make. Uh, I uh, hadn't used MongoDB for quite a few years. I think a lot of developers have that common experience too. Um, that was a technically for the front end of Best Buy.com. So I was primarily a front end developer, uh, and I've been using MongoDB for years. Or like I used it five years ago, uh, but a lot's changed in it. So I'm hoping to just kind of give a quick little like. What's changed since probably last time you've seen it? Been in there too, um, and then we're going to talk about introduction to serverless. We talk about what it is, how to use it, pros and cons, what's the options out there, and how does Stitch fit into that kind of ecosystem. Uh, and then last, we're going to go through a guided tutorial um, of setting everything up. All right, cool. Let's jump in. So first things first, um, I'm hoping this I'm going to be overview will be fast, and I'm hoping it's going to be useful for you guys too. Um, there's a lot of stuff that, like I said, I didn't even know was new or like MongoDB like featured. Um, so first things first, uh, MongoDB uh, it scales differently than traditional RDBMSs. So MongoDB scales horizontally, and it does that via sharding. 
So you can scale up horizontally and split your data up. So instead of buying bigger servers, you just buy different ones and start splitting your, different up, your data up on those different databases. As opposed to traditional legacy RDMSs, you have to buy bigger and bigger databases to split that data up. You can do sharding, but it's more challenging. Uh, other thing too, MongoDB is a NoSQL data store. Uh, specifically, it's a document data store too, which means that you can um, save data um, in the language, in data types you're used to, from JavaScript, right, you've got objects, um, dictionaries, uh, hash maps, whatever, right? Um, you can save your data in the format you're used to working with it, as opposed to using databases and having to save it in traditional rows and columns, uh, which makes sense for a lot of developers getting up to speed on stuff, saving, saving and working with the data the way that you use it. Great. I think too, the benefit of using document stores too is being able to embed documents within each other. So all the data you need is within a single document. So you don't have to make multiple joins or queries on databases to get all the data you need for the end client, which can end up being faster for um, end users. Slow animation, great. And lastly, um, allows you to pivot easier by adding different data types too. Um, I will make a side note on here too. MongoDB now supports data validation at a document level or at the database level. So you just have to use like an ORM to do some document validation. You can actually do that at the database layer these days. Um, and most of the stuff that you can do with a traditional RBMS can be done with a MongoDB databases. Cool. Just has different names. One th thing I've noticed with MongoDB is the naming is kind of weird too. You're going to see a terrible naming all over the place. Um, okay, cool. Some other things here. Um, MongoDB, as of 4.2, now supports distributed ACID transactions. So if you have a shorter database, you can now perform ACID compliant transactions on those data models. Um, it now supports field level encryption, which means you can, you can, of course, encrypt your entire database, but you can also encrypt specific fields within that database too. Um, and as of yesterday, we're now PCI compliant, which means you can, we're able to save personal, personally identifiable by diet identifiable information in a Mongo database as well. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, as a schema bit validation too. So I'm hoping this is like useful information. Um, I'm hoping that it's stuff you probably didn't know MongoDB did. Um, yeah, great. Uh, okay, cool. So if there's any questions about like MongoDB or like what's going on with it, love to chat about that too, obviously. Um, but great, let's just get into it. So. I guess, any questions so far? Intro, I wanted to just go through that quickly. Okay, um, cool. Is anyone else hot in here? I'm like so like super hot. Can we, where's the, Chris, is it possible to turn thing down or something? Um, uh, okay, cool, so serverless, great. Obviously serverless MN, I see a guy with a serverless sticker up here in front, probably works with serverless. Um, but for those who don't know what it is, right, this is a gentle introduction to it. Um, what is it? Um, I, I want to kind of talk about some high-level stuff, but um, basically serverless allows you or makes it so that devs don't have to manage infrastructure anymore. You're only managing application code. Um, I love this tweet from Kelsey Hightower. Um, says, I remember the days when I built my own gaming PCs. Eventually sold out and bought an Xbox because I just wanted to play games and not build gaming rigs. Serverless is like that. I love this analogy. Because um, he's not saying like building rigs is bad or they're, they're, no one's building them anymore. Like people, are, people still have specific needs for building apps that require full-time servers. But 99% of applications don't. Um, and if you're like me and maintaining infrastructure is a pain in the ass, Serverless is the route for you, right? And most of us, like most apps, like again, there's always cases where you need to do some advanced stuff, but most of the time you're just doing like CRUD apps, getting and pulling data from some database. Um, and if you want to manage infrastructure anymore, serverless is a great, cheap option for you. So I want to talk about like where it's good and where it's where you should be avoiding it. Um, so uh, serverless, um, this is serverless in general, all platforms, right? Um, so on a serverless platform, you're no longer managing the infrastructure. So that means that the company that is managing the infrastructure is uh, responsible for spinning up your containers. There's all the orchestration level, like spin them up, they spin them down for you, and you're only paying for the function that you use or the data that's going through the tubes. Um, you're no longer provisioning databases or sizes or like auto scaling up. Typically, the person handling your infrastructure is maintaining patch releases, upgrades, et cetera. 
you don't have to worry about any of that. It's totally abstracted away. No capacity planning. Um, so obviously at Best Buy, we had a capacity planning was a big deal for us for Black Fridays. So everything we did, we had to think about how that load was going to perform during Black Fridays um, and made sure that we could scale up in time. So a big chunk of our work that we were doing was capacity planning. With the service platform, you don't have to worry about that anymore. The company's fully managing that for you and scaling. You're just firing off a function to the ether, goes and does some work, and it scales down, and that's all you pay for. Uh, there's also been a bunch of acad academic studies done on the impact of serverless development on teams. So it's cheaper infrastructure-wise. You no longer have to do any of these tasks, but they've actually found that it's increased delivery speeds um, up to 77% for teams. I've got a link to that study down there as well. And they found, too, there was a 26% decrease in their AWS bill by switching to a serverless platform, which is great. Awesome. Um, so I do want to pull one thing out to you. So uh, something I always get when I talk about serverless is serverless is kind of a, what's a, like a misnomer, right? It's serverless is, in fact, there are servers you're running on someone's computers. They're just, you don't care about it. Um, yes. So I just want to acknowledge here too, serverless does have servers, um, but uh, we get it, right? It's fine. It's, it's fine. We get it. Yeah. It's a, a serverless is, is computers, but you, the point is you don't have to worry about it um, if you don't want to. So, okay, cool. Actually, and I, Totally, yes. Well, actually, I don't have this in my slide deck here, but can anyone talk about what are some of the cons of using a service platform? So we talked about, obviously, all of these guys, but what? So what happens with um, persisting data? Yes, well, that's where, that's where we would come into. Um, so a lot of them, because the idea of most serverless functions is they should be stateless functions. And obviously, MongoDB is a, a, a state store. We're saying, saving data. Um, and a lot of, and that's actually one of the distinguishing things between Stitch and other platforms too. Is like, we're a great way to access that with a with a data model. Um, there's another thing I want to bring up too with serverless in general is by taking that leap of faith, you aren't you're no longer handling that. And in some cases, you might have an instance where you haven't hit your function for a while, so that's that's that function is not hot or not fresh in cache in someone else's server. So that your uh, container is not spun up, um, and it takes there can be slow times to kind of get that function spun up in time too. And there's ways to mitigate that by like just firing off functions just to keep things hot in memory in them, but you lose that control. Um, and that'd be an example where a serverless platform would not make a good choice for your application if that's needed. Uh, but again, for like 90% of applications, it's not that big. If you're like Netflix or Google, sure that matters, but um, most of the time it doesn't matter. That's true too. I mean, if you're hitting that thing a lot, you're probably it's probably you have a good chance to keep that thing hot in 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 cache in someone else's data centers. But you don't know. You don't know. You're probably okay though. Um, yeah. I mean, so personally, I use it a lot too for apps that are, yeah, where performance isn't like I don't if if occasionally we get a slow request, not a big deal. Like, it's not a great experience, but every once in a while you're gonna hit that. That's okay. Um, or basic crowd apps where I'm just kind of doing some basic operations. I'll usually pull it out of a serverless platform too. And I just do it selfishly because it's just cheaper, which is, I think, a big sell for most business people or in charge of like the budgets. It's the easy way for you to sell that to your boss or technically it's on your team too. What about someone your boss, not you, or what have you seen or are you using your Yes, interesting. Oh, I got it. That's, that brings us actually to um, Stitch actually. So MongoDB Stitch is a, um, it's a cross-platform serverless, or serverless um, platform. Um, which it actually, so we're, we don't have lock-in. We will, Stitch can be hosted on any platform, GCP, Azure, or um, AWS, um, which I think you get vendor lock-in a lot. So if you go to Lambda, you're stuck with Lambda, right? Um, but with like Stitch, if you're just looking to access a MongoDB database, it's, it makes a great fit and you can move to anywhere, no problem. Um, we'll talk about that more in depth here. But um, yeah, let me go over that one more time. So MongoDB Stitch, we, we unveiled it probably like two years ago. Um, to be honest, I hadn't heard of it before I started working there too. I wouldn't be surprised if you guys hadn't either. Um, hence me being here too today. But um, uh, it's a serverless platform we developed to work exact work with our cloud MongoDB data stores, um, and it can be hosted on any 
any platform. It's platform agnostic, uh, which is great. So if you're, yeah, if you're on AWS and you want to put your data, you want to like have low latency times and within your data center make function calls, you can do that. Doesn't matter. Um, cool. So what is it? Um, I'm going to be Stitch allows you to. Yeah, I got a question back. Yeah. Um, unfortunately not. So it has to be like right now. It's only for cloud providers, and maybe in the future. I don't know that for a fact. I can I can I can for sure figure that out. Because um, right now we have um, MongoDB. You have of course the Community Edition. It's always free. We have the Enterprise Edition. You pay a license for. And now we have MongoDB Atlas, which is like our host hosted cloud option. Um, but if you sign up for Atlas and have Atlas host your data, Stitch comes free with it. Um, and of course, there's free tiers. We'll talk about stuff too. But um, cool. So Stitch. Stitch allows you to do a bunch of cool stuff. Um, query anywhere. Uh, so you can query like you would from the MongoDB REPL uh, in any application. So it's primarily for like front end applications. You can just write out like a MongoDB query like you normally would from a REPL, get that data, and use it on the client side. Uh, you can do functions. So I'm going to be showing it. I'm going to be doing, no, we'll get to it a little bit. Functions, you can write code just like you would with a Lambda function. You can do that exactly with our, with MongoDB Stitch. Uh, and triggers. This is cool too, especially for a persistent data store. So you can do, a, you can trigger some sort of function that runs whenever some sort of event happens in your database. Like a new item gets posted to the journal or um, the example I'm going to show you today, we're going to set up a, um, we're going to fire off an email with AWS's um, simple email service, SES whenever someone shares a journal with, with you. So this is going to be triggered. It's going to look to see if that event has been triggered. It'll automatically fire off a function and do that data or do that service for you. But you can do anything you want, right? Um, and auto mobile syncing too. So if it can, it can push data to mobile devices if data has changed on the database. This is still in beta, and we're going to talk about this. There's going to be some changes coming to this in a little bit. But. All right. Uh, and I want to show this too. I put together, this is like a sample MongoDB cloud architecture that you could possibly use. Um, man, I don't have a mouse in, in this mode here. Um, so this would be basically, Stitch works great for front end architectures. Um, and it can be either mobile or some sort of front end client heavy application. And um, either the back end or the front end services can communicate with Stitch, any of the triggers or any of the APIs. And then access data in the MongoDB Atlas cloud store. All right, so we're saving your data in the cloud. Stitch kind of sits on top of that, and you can access that on any of your, any of your client applications via serverless, serverless calls in Stitch. Cool. All right, uh, let's see here. I am going to skip through this. I do want to get to the multi-region though. I think one of the cool distinguishing factors here too, which a lot of other data stores don't do, if you host your data with Atlas and you Stitch, um, MongoDB will automatically, you can set it up so MongoDB will automatically split up data and distribute that like, around the world for you. So remember we talked about horizontal sharding? Um, a great feature of that too is you can locate data close to where your users are. So for example, you have a user collection. You can put all your users for those different collections and shard them by where they are geographically and save the data to them. Um, the benefit of that then is you get uh, a uh, lower latency. So the data is right where they need to, and it automatically splits that data up for you and keeps the data close to your customers or whoever. Cool. All right. Great. Um, any questions so far? Any questions so far? We're going to be going through all those functions that query anywhere, uh, uh, the, the functions and triggers we're going to be going through today in our live demo. Any questions so far? Okay, cool. So Stitch, um, how does it compare? Um, obviously the big players right now are um, Azure, GCP, and AWS Lambda, and Firebase too, um, and Stitch. Just we play with those other players, like I mentioned before. Um, I think um, I think the key thing here is flexibility, um, and it, it should be, um, it, MongoDB Stitch is useful if most of your application is gonna be on the client side of your application. So you don't have databases like large monoliths or microservices that are doing all the work. MongoDB makes a great fit. Um, and if you're doing, if you're, um, you want to abstract the data, put that on the client side to access data from the, a database, particularly from a MongoDB database. So if you're using MongoDB for your back end, it makes a lot of sense to just do that. And you don't want to build out servers that are running 24 seven. You can use a stitch model to access that data directly. Uh, and MongoDB Stitch and Atlas works 
seamlessly. If you already have a MongoDB database, you're hosting it. It's really easy to import it in there. Start using it immediately too. Okay. Yes. Yeah, and these are all, all these great are really great functions too. Um, yeah, that, comparatively, the price is about the same. Um, really, the thing I think you got to think about is what kind of data are you using, um, and how do you want that data being used, and are the other providers? It's like is geospatial charting important to you? That makes that's great too. Um, and if you're already using MongoDB databases, that's like it's like a no-brainer um, to start using Stitch. Cool. All right, cool. So let's see here. Um, I'm gonna go through here, guided serverless service. This is where the bulk of the talk is. Um, I am going to, uh, I'm gonna be jumping into code here today for real, um, but this isn't gonna be code heavy. Um, I wanna give code to kind of make things more concrete and kind of show what the code is or like how these applications get built. Um, but personally, what I find too with like talks like this, I don't remember any of the code. Um, and like I said, I want this talk for you to just know about what's there and available and if and when it should be used by you in the future, right? There's lots of great applications, with lots of other great databases. Awesome, it's not gonna be a great fit for everyone. But if it is, I want you to at least know so you can come back to it. That's, all, that's, that's the goal for today. So anyway, let's jump in. Um, we're gonna be building a journal with React um, and Mong MongoDB Stitch. So I'm gonna just fire this up here real fast. This is a little, actually, you know what? I think I got it running here. Um, there it is, localhost. Cool, um, great. Um, so I've actually logged in already on here, but what we're gonna be doing is, it, oh, thank you. Great, yes, thank you. Um, this app's going to be doing basically all the CRUD operations for a journal. So um, server plus MN, um, new post, great, and some app. So we're going to be saving that to a MongoDB database in the cloud. You can make updates to it. New post, great. Of course, delete it. Um, another cool thing we're going to be doing today, too, is implementing the share function. So it can share this with anybody, and it's going to fire off an email notifying them that this journal's been shared with them. And then when they log in, be able to access that and see what's going on with that your post. Cool. All right, cool. I'm just going to blow that up then too. Okay, cool. I always keep a GIF back up in case either I can't connect to the internet or something dies. At least someone, I can at least go through something if it uh, doesn't go through. But um, let's go through this app architecture again too. So we have our, our Atlas cloud, MongoDB database in the cloud. We have a a, a journal document or journal database with a entries collection within that, that the database. Um, and within Stitch, we're going to be building a trigger. So when someone clicks on share, we're going to be firing off a function called notify users of share. And that'll be firing off another function to AWS's simple email service to send them an email notifying them that they've been shared with. Uh, and then we're going to have the React journal kind of consuming data from that Stitch app in real time. I'm kind of go through that works. Can I get a show of hands too? Who's um, who's like a front end engineer in here? Cool. Any React people? Any use React? Okay, cool. Gotcha. Um, is it mostly back end people in the house right now? Some nods, yeah. Okay. Um, cool. Awesome. I find uh, serverless is a great transition point for front end developers too. Um, we're used to not managing infrastructure and building a client side application and rules and logic, uh, and it's really easy for us to just kind of get the spun up. Um, I picked it up pretty quickly too, so I hope you guys do as well. Okay, great. Um, first things first, I do want to show you quickly what this looks like, but we have um, setting up cloud.mongodb.com. Um, if you're going to set up a new MongoDB database with Atlas, oops, you'll be setting up a new Atlas cloud or cluster. So let's just go through what it looks like. Here, so this is actually a cluster I'd set up already. These are some of the, you can already see some of the logic that I just showed you here today. Thank you. And great. So building a cluster is super easy. You can pick the provider that you, you want to host it on. This will host it wherever you want it to be, and you can pick the region that's being hosted on as well. Um, note here too, it's important, the free tier. It's 
especially when we're first starting out, just stick with the free tier stuff. Um, I've been using this a lot. I've been giving tons of talks, demos, and working this forever. I've never hit. I've never had to pay for it. I don't. I've never hit it. So I, we can go through the pricing model. I can't even remember what it is, but um, it's pretty generous. Uh, yeah. Yes. Wait, what's it? Yes. Yes. Mm hmm. It's not yet. You'd have to you'd have to migrate it off. Um, and there's lots of migration strategies. We do that too. Typically, we we do something that we'll do a MongoDB. We'll, we'll dump that data out. We'll import it in, and we'll keep sending data to both sources redundantly until you're ready to make the full switch. So you have like two backup copies. Um, we are working on implementing that though right now, trying to make it easy to migrate between them. Um, but that is not available as of yet. Uh, cool, great. I think you get like eight gigs of RAM, 40 gigs of storage for free. Um, yeah. And you can rename your clusters too. But I'm, I already created one, so I'm not gonna set this up right now, but I just wanna show what that looks like. This is kinda, after it's initiated, this is what that sandbox looks like. Cool, great. Uh, okay. Let's see here. Um, yeah. Okay. Great. So let's just let's jump into some code here. Let's get this a little bit bigger. Can anyone see the with the dark mode on? Sometimes dark mode's hard to see in a the uh, TVs here. Too big. <laughs> Is that all right? Okay. It's a small room. Hopefully we can uh, we can hopefully we can figure it out here. Uh, great. Here we go. I'm trying to make that a little bit smaller. Uh, so this is MongoDB. Stitch has a JavaScript npm package. We just import. Um, we're importing that package and instantiating that. Basically, we're just setting it up. The key here too is um, you're just passing through the app ID that you get from your your store when you set it up. So let's go back over here. I'm gonna go to my Stitch apps in the GUI. And we'll pull out that. Uh, I need to jump back in here. We got our app ID over here. We just can copy that and pull that in here, but which I already have done. Um, but that's being passed through. And once you've done that, you basically it you've you've hooked it up. You've hooked up your application to the cloud. That's all you really need. You pull in that package, pass through your app ID, and it's connected. There's a couple more things we're going to do here, but um, to get to that initial point, that's all you need to do. Uh, the other thing here, too, so I think MongoDB has traditionally had a reputation for being an insecure database, and I think that's been something the product team has taken a serious, um, what's the word? They've taken it very seriously. So with MongoDB Stitch and new versions of MongoDB, um, authentication is absolutely man mandatory. And the problem before was like, Ease of use was like balancing ease of use versus security. Um, getting an app, like getting a server set up, was really easy, but we left it vulnerable. Um, and now authentication is mandatory to access that data. So if you're going to set up a new Stitch platform, you have to set up new uh, applications. Uh, Stitch is really cool though too. Out of the box, it allows you to set up. Um, uh, you can use email passwords. Uh, you can use OAuth um, or um, any of your uh, JWT tokens or a bunch of other providers, custom providers, whatever you need. Um, it allows you to hook up at basically anything you want. Um, for this application, though, I'm going to be setting up with just simple email and password to get new, user, new users logged in. So um, I just want to go through what that looks like now, too. Yeah, I've, um, I, I think I, I'm, I'm a big fan of making authentication default. And I think we're going to start seeing that more often, too, with online APIs, um, in particular databases, too. But um, yeah, adding users is really easy. Just add, setting up new emails, addresses, and passwords. You can do that through the GUI. Um, or two, you can set it up so that new users can be set up through the application too, which I have not done for this demo. But OK. OK, cool. So um, we've set up some users. We've got our application set up with uh, the SDK. And now we want to actually start making queries from our, our front end application. So how do we do that? Uh, well, let's look at the code one more time. I do want to go over this thing here. So um, when we're instantiating our, our front end application, we're creating a this.mongodb object. And we're basically getting that service. We're basically hooking up 
our application to, um, to our cloud store. Uh, and the key here, I want to show you down here, what we're doing is passing through that object down to the props of the child's React components. And let's take a look at what that looks like over here. Can I make this bigger? Okay, journal, yeah, here we go. So this is that journal. This is the, this is the component we're passing it down to. And you can see here on the props, we're requiring that that MongoDB object is being passed down to that. that. And then the constructor, what we're doing is we're accessing the exact collection from that. So we have, we're accessing our journal and then our entries collection within the journal database. I have this all set up in a config file somewhere else, which is why it looks like that, but. Okay, cool. So we've instantiated it, we hooked that up. Um, and the journal, what's doing, it will go and get the, the initial things from that database in that collection. And that's actually, we can go down to the component did not keep method. And what we're doing is just running entries that find. So this is the exact MongoDB query language you'd use in a REPL or anywhere, like just from the MongoDB. Should, should be one to one, um, which is awesome. So we're on the, fr on the front end client side application. We're making MongoDB queries to go get that data exactly how we're used to getting it. Um, this is just getting that initial set of data, but I do want to show you some other ones. So this is the add entry. We're constructing a brand new document. And then we're inserting that into our, our collection, the entries collection on that, on that journal database. Same thing with removing, right? We're deleting based on document IDs, whatever, and then updating the state of the application with that removed item on there. Updates, all that, right? Um, should be still the same. Cool. So key here with the query is once you've set up that connection to the cloud, you can start making queries from the client side application like you would on a server. You can do this on, so this is JavaScript. I think we have SDKs for iOS, Android, and JavaScript right now. So most of the big um, client side application languages. And I don't know about roadmaps for more to come, but I'm sure they're, I'm sure they're doing, doing some work with that. Um, yep, so you use the same query language. You can access on the client side. Um, yes. And we haven't talked about this much too, but we can manage user roles for that data too. So we're setting new user and database. We can control what data they have access to. So it's not just a big fire hose of data. Which maybe we can, uh, well, yeah, we're not gonna get that to today. Okay, so any questions so far? We've covered um, setting up the SDK. We've covered setting up new users and authentication, how it's mandatory. And we also covered basic queries, like the credit syntax too. Um, you can also do more complex stuff too, like aggregation pipeline, more complicated stuff from the client side as well. Anything you can do on the server, server side, you can do on the client side with Stitch. Yeah, question, yes. 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 Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Good questions. The question was, um, how does how would uh, Stitch play with Redux or another data store besides just straight up React states? Um, yeah, and that's a great question. I think it would. So, like these functions should be the same. Um, but instead of updating that component state, I think you just update, fire off a, uh, an action to the reducer to update the store. Um, so you, yeah, exactly. Um, not out of the box. You'd have to like, you'd have to write it out to do that. But um, so similar like how we're making the queries here in that component. This is actually probably how I'd recommend doing it with a Redux application. Like you'd want to have that logic within that component, um, and then the state management be there. But yeah, you'd want you'd be replicating that's that that state um, locally and in the cloud. Yeah. Oh, totally. You totally could. If you want to go like extreme with it too and like have all of your safety managed in Stitch, you could totally do that. Um, yeah. And I'm trying to think of like things where that might be useful. I, like a lot, like obviously, I, I, honestly, I wouldn't recommend old time. Like if you had a form, I wouldn't be updating the state of a form in the cloud because that latency issues, I'm going to wait for that. I just want that saved locally. But there may be instances where you want to have that managed everywhere. All right. Cool. 
Um, great. So services. We talked about how this application, we're going to be setting off, firing off emails if you get someone shares that get the database server or shares a journal entry with you. Um, out of the box, Stitch actually has a bunch of stuff it integrates with. Um, and I'm just going to show this quickly. I'm going to make this bigger. Um, so I'm going to add a service here too. So out of the box, we have Twilio. So sending and receiving text messages. There's finally the GitHub events. Um, and there's 20 plus AWS, serv AWS services we have access to, or just simple HTTP requests to kind of integrate with anything if you wanted to. Um, I am going to show, let's see here. Uh, actually, no, I'm going to go back here. This is my simple email service service hooked up. Um, and can I mess with this on here? Oops, got to change those keys now. <laughs> okay, that's fine. Um, here we go. So this is a bunch of the services that come that integrate with AWS out of the box. And again, these are just ones that, and we're gonna be, we add new ones all the time. But it has an HTTP service, so you can hook up anything you want, anything that access the web, you can connect with easy. Great functions that, to talk to that. Um, I'm not a big AWS guy, so I don't know what many of these acronyms mean, <laughs> but. <laughs> But it does all these. Okay. So um, we're going to be creating a Stitch service that allows us to send emails out. So we need to do a couple things. We're going to need to, uh, well, let's see here. Wait. This first thing you want to do is we add a service. So we're going to we add the AWS simple email service here. Also, we're importing the service in so we have access to it. As you saw in that previously, I put the or the API keys in there. But it basically allows our Stitch app to have access to these services now. Um, and then in the next step here, we can write a function then that allows us to fire that code off. So let's go, I'm going to show you what our functions look like on here. Um, and I've actually created a, a function called notify user of share. This is what that function looks like. Um, one thing to note. Stitch functions have to be written in JavaScript. Um, for the time being, that's the, the language you, you have to write them in. Um, and another thing I will note here too, um, AWS func or um, Stitch functions can be written through the GUI like this, but we also have a CLI, um, which allows you to do version control of your functions and manage that locally in a text editor too. Most of the big serverless platforms have a CLI, we do too. Um, and for me, the big thing is, especially when you start scaling your application, Organizing your, your serverless functions becomes kind of challenging because each function is doing one specific functional thing. Um, it's usually very tiny and you're chaining together many of these things and that can start to get pretty wild pretty quickly. Um, and that helps to start version controlling that and managing that in a text editor that we feel more comfortable with as opposed to a WYSIWYG editor online. But it's always there, great, right? Easy out of the box, but there's a CLI available. Um, but uh, yes, we are, we're pulling in that service, we're formatting an email message, um, and then we're basically use, using that service that we'd integrated earlier to send that email out to whoever was that, that function was shared with. Uh, this function gets run on every single event in here, and we check to make sure that that is what we want it to be. We're checking to see if it matches our condition of it being the shared with field having changed in either an insert, update, or replace method in the database. And if it is, if that field was updated or changed, then we fire off that event. That's basically what we're looking for. Okay. Cool. A little picture of that. Uh, and then lastly, the trigger. So this part I think is really cool too, and I think makes sense with a service like Stitch, where you are, the service is sitting right on top of the database layer. That's, like, that's what it does best. Um, but we're basically waiting for those database changes to happen. Um, and we can fire that on there too. So I'm going to show you what that looks like. Um, we're going to create a brand new trigger in here. And this is looking for a database trigger. You can also do things that will run once a day, like a cron job, or if some user logs in, we fire up event. We're looking for some sort of database change on here. So on shared um, event enabled, we pick which, where the, which cloud or where we want that to be pulled from, which database, which collection within that database, 
and then which updates we want to be looking for. So if something's inserted, updated, or replaced, we don't really care about deleting because it's gone. We don't need to notify anybody if it's gone. Um, full document allows you to have access to that full document uh, in the logs and, um, and the application that fired off that event. And then you can choose a function. We wrote this last function, so we just say we want to fire off this serverless function every single time this event gets triggered in our database. And that's it. I already did this, so I'm just going to cancel it. And then, great. OK, so we have one last piece here, actually. Is there a reason you want more access to the documents? It depends. Um, who wouldn't want it? That's true, yeah. And I think you can control that to, yeah, if it's like, yeah, it's, uh, it's secure data. If you did like, so we did like field level encryption, um, it would show you the hash value for that too. But um, I don't know if you're trying to like reduce, because like, if you want to reduce the load over the network too, make this, the size of that thing smaller. I think you only get access to things that are changed in there. Um, so you'd only see the update events and then the field that got updated, I think, by default. But if you want to access the full document that got changed, so for example, like we want this, we'd want the whole lot document so we could share the rest of the data to those users. Um, but good question. Okay. Oh, great. Okay, perfect. Um, triggers. And you can set up multiple triggers per collection. Typically, you see that with a service application. You're kind of chaining together multiple things. This happens to this, and then this, then this, and this. It kind of goes through a trigger pipeline until eventually it gets transformed enough and ready for that, the user or whatever you want to do with that data. OK, last, things, last thing here. This one's pretty simple, the logs. Um, I'm going to be using the logs here to kind of show how the email is working. Because um, I've set up these users, or users are using my application. I can't obviously log into my user's app email application. Um, and I'm not emotionally prepared to open up my email in front of all y'all today. Um, so we're just going to look at our logs to make sure that this event's actually happened as expected. Um, logs are extremely useful for, I mean, troubleshooting any sort of platform, but especially for a serverless platform. That's where, this is about the only insight you have to what's going on behind the scenes. Um, and sometimes you have to use it to go do some sleuthing to kind of do some troubleshooting what's going on. Um, but yeah, also keeps track of everything that's in there too. So let's take a look at that. Um, so this is right in the Stitch logs here. And uh, great. Yep, so by default, it shows you everything in here too. Um, this, I, this is the, I deleted the, I think this is the test entry I created earlier today. Uh, doesn't show you anything on there. OK, logs done. Um, but oh, yeah, this is the one I made at the beginning of the thing today. Uh, let's test this out. I want to, what I'm going to do is make a new entry on here. Let's do shared post. And please share this with everyone. OK, we're not going to share with everyone. But um, here we go. I'm going to share this with a new user. I think I have one in here, liberty stitch at gmail.com. It's a user that's already in our database or in our users. Uh, liberty stitch, I think it's one, and share. Okay, cool. And then, so we got that shared with. That looks confirmed. But let's check the logs to make sure that that's actually happening as expected. And this looks really good. So we have this trigger. This unshared item just got triggered, and this update one just also got triggered. So let's make sure this is what we expect it to be. Uh, great function. Insert one. Shared post, and yes. Yep. So this is the post we just created. We inserted this into our database. Looks like we got an error. Can I access? OK, because so, we didn't, we didn't, no one was shared with it, so it errored out. Um, and then you can see on here, we updated our field to add that new user to the shared with user field, which is an array in our database. We're pushing that. We're updating and pushing a new instance of that to the array in our document for that, for that journal entry. And then you can see here, this trigger was also was fired off, and it's the unshared item trigger. You can see that this is the email message that I got sent off to that user. Let me create a bit. 
not very pretty, but uh, that should have worked. Okay, cool. Um, yes, um, so that's it for like the, the live demo. Um, I'm gonna do a couple things here. I'm, I'm gonna be posting, I've written a, uh, a blog post it's a little PDF document. If you're interested in redoing this, it kind of steps you step by step by step on how to do this on your own. It includes the, re the React code, everything to do. Um, I also include some API keys too, so you guys can get set up really easily on there too. Um, but if you're looking to get started on it, it's a great way to just kind of get fired up and kind of copy this on it too. Um, covers all the basics that you need to get running on it. Uh, I'll post on my Twitter. Yep, I'll be posting on my Twitter today. Yeah, oh perfect, yeah, great, Servo Summit. Yeah, that'd be great. That's uh, okay. Uh, good question. No, just HTTP right now. Um, yeah, that'd be awesome though. I'm like even think I'm like getting flashbacks to Meteor with um, WebSockets with their MongoDB data store on the back end. Um, no, not right now. It's it's all it's all stateless. And I think I don't know. Has anyone done sock sockets with uh, serverless components before? I haven't heard of that before really. Um, you cut we cut a little bit. Oh really? Awesome. I wonder if there'd be like a pricing difference because it'd be keeping open your containers or that like instance longer. So you're going to be probably paying more for that. But if I mean, I could especially see that for like an IoT device or something where you want like near real time analytics or like real time data streaming in, that could be really useful. Um, so long story short, no, don't support WebSockets right now. Um, but I, I, I may, I'll ask the product team about that. Actually, that's a really good question. Uh, I want to talk a little bit too about kind of my uh, my view of the future of development and particularly serverless. Um, but what I'm seeing right now in the industry is a continued abstraction away from complexity. Um, we're seeing that with like things like Firebase, AWS, GCP, all of them, and Stitch. We're all like everyone's trying to make scale and development easier. And I think that generally in programming. We're seeing higher order programming languages that abstracting away garbage collection and memory management and that sort of thing. I think we're seeing that now happening at an infrastructure level. Um, I think we're at the beginning of serverless, and I think it's going to be massive. I think it's going to blow up because um, Kubernetes is like hot right now. But has anyone, do you have any Kubernetes devs in here? We have one. It's a couple. It's, do you like working with Kubernetes? Kubernetes is fucking hard. It's hard to work with. You do. No, it's cool. It's awesome. And I think there's, there continue to be a need for it. Obviously, like these cloud providers are dealing with massive orchestration layers. It's a, a little learning curve. It's hard. It's, it's hard and we haven't quite figured it out yet. And most people don't need to learn Kubernetes. Like most people shouldn't have to learn Kubernetes to have to spin up an app. And Kubernetes is probably overkill from, again, 95% of applications. Um, when you do need to manage the infrastructure at that level, great, awesome, or you scale up that, like, cool. Um, but I think we're gonna, I think the industry is gonna move towards abstracting that away as much as possible. And I think they're gonna get better about it, it's gonna get faster, it's gonna get cheaper. Um, yeah, I really don't see it going anytime soon. Um, there's one other thing too I wanna note here too. Uh, you probably don't know this, but MongoDB bought a company called Realm. Had anyone heard of Realm before? Yeah? Oh, really? Yeah, 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 yep. So we're, this is coming 2020. Um, all the features I showed you today are gonna still be there, but we're basically moving everything you saw here under the Realm brand. Um, Realm has been used for, yeah, database, like mobile database management kind of stuff. Um, but we're basically moving all of our, our serverless stuff under that, that, that platform. And probably, and the reason for that is more, more people have heard of Realm than Stitch. No one's heard of Stitch before, so <laughs> they're trying to move it to something that makes people have heard of a little bit more. Um, but also, Realm's awesome too. So everything with Realm is staying the same too. So if you're, you're using Realm, love it, cool. It's also in the same. We're just moving our serverless platform under that umbrella as well. So branding may look different here in middle of 2020 next year, but everything's gonna be exactly the same. There'll probably be more features as well. Um, I guess, is anyone else who's been doing serverless, does anyone have any other thoughts on the future of serverless or kind of where the industry's going? That's okay. I'm putting everyone on the spot right now, too. So it's. Yeah. No, absolutely. It's cheap. 
Right. I hate paying for stuff with side projects. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. No, oh, that's Netlify is dope too. Um, actually, I'm working on a MongoDB plugin for Netlify right now too. Um, hopefully, that'll be out soon. Um, yeah, I, 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 I think. I mean, that's the reason. Like, this is a very new meetup in the Twin Cities. I think it's a new tech, generally. Um, but I think you guys are making like an investment early in that, and I think it's a good investment you're making in your careers too. Kind of at least understanding where that's going. Okay. Cool. A um, couple things. So, oh yeah, um, FAQs. Uh, Stitch, is it free? Yes. Uh, looks like you get 25 gigs per month of free data transfer. That's over the wire. Data goes back and forth. Um, looks like you get, uh, I don't know, some sort of some known million seconds. I don't know what that, uh, what that even is. <laughs> I should figure that out. Um, I've never hit it. It's, I've been using it for all my free website projects, um, all my demos. I use it all the time. I've never hit it. Um, Let's see here, cool. Is there, do I have to use a GUI? No, there's a CLI available. Do I have to use JavaScript to write the serverless functions? Yes, you do. Um, and then if you want, I have a special one-time use only. You get $200 of free credits if you do go over. Um, you can just have $200 of free credits in your account too. Um, but if you go to bit.ly.serverlessmn, um, you'll get $200 free to your account too if you sign up. So I know you out there that you don't have to use the CLI. So yes. But can you use like files? Uh, yes, I think so. Uh, yes. Mm -hmm. No, you'll have to set up. I think you'll have to set up. If you want, you may be able to do it like in your function, but I think it makes more sense to do it through the GUI. So that may have to do it like once per Stitch application. Oh, totally. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, I um, I don't think you can manage like the actual service integrations unless you did the directly integrate with it from that function, um, which is pros and cons to doing that too. I agree, that would be pros and cons. I've never thought about that before. Um, could you do it? Yes, you could. You totally could do it. Um, and those are just the ones we have. Click a button and it just kind of integrates for you. Um, yeah, uh, I'm also going to say about that too. Oh yeah, version control management. I use Git for my serverless functions when I do do it through the CLI. I just manage it all on my own. And, yeah, it's, which is super helpful. Uh, okay, great. Uh, almost done, I promise. Um, so today we talked about, um, I went over some stuff with MongoDB, so some updates, PCI compliant, distributed asset transaction compliance. Um, I don't remember this stuff we talked about, uh, whatever. Security, asset compliancy, that sort of stuff too. New features. Um, we went through introduction of serverless, and then we talked about, we configured a new Stitch app, the journal app, so we set up the new SDK, we set up some users in there to connect to the SDK. We made some queries, so those basic CRUD commands from the front end of a React application. Um, and then we created a service with AWS to send out emails, and we triggered that, and we checked the logs to make sure that was actually happening as expected. Cool. A um, Couple closing thoughts here before I release you to the hounds. Um, so I'm new to MongoDB. Like I said, it just started a couple months ago. Uh, and my new, like my new engineering training was university at mongodb.com. And it's totally open to everybody. Um, all my technical training, you can go, it's like, they have like intro 101 courses, schema design, whatever, to like nuts and bolts of how does the wire tiger storage engine actually work from like a hardware level. Um, you can get as deep as you want in it. And it's totally free, and it's exactly what we use internally to learn the product. Um, so totally check that out. Other thing I'll, I'll, um, I'll hawk here too, we have a com MongoDB community Slack channel. So that's a great place to connect with other people if you're having problems with MongoDB, you have questions about it, pricing, how does this work, this thing screwed up. Uh, I want to connect with other entrepreneurs who are using this and trying to scale and dealing with problems, how do they deal with it. It's a great place to go and talk to people about that too. Um, cool. Uh, I'll be posting this, all these resources on my Twitter today too. But if you use that link, you get $200 in free credits on Atlas. Um, I've never had to use them, but it's great to have a couple bucks in case something happens. Uh, maybe your app goes viral and you have to spend a couple bucks to keep it uh, keep it up and running. You know, never know. Um, and then there's documentation there for Stitch on the bottom there too. Cool. Oh, I got a gift here of Keanu Reeves. There we go. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. You guys have been awesome. Amazing questions. Um, yeah, no, it's been, it's been a blast. And uh, yeah, again, that's my thing. Follow me on Twitter or whatever. If you want access to that stuff, I'll be posting it afterwards. Serverless MN will be doing that too. And thank you. <laughs> yes.
Oh, and swag. I have um, sock, 